Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. I'm Eden Lane. Thanks for joining us on In Focus. This week we're bringing you a new artist program. Well, it's not really new, it's about four years old. It's called Artists of the West and it's part of American Furniture Warehouse. We're gonna have a chance to find out how this program even began and talk to some of the artists whose work is on display here. It has a real impact because these are local artists and the company that produces the graphics that are on sale is also a Colorado company. Longmont-based Circle Graphics is the world's largest producer of large format digital graphics. The 200,000 square foot facility operates around the clock seven days a week. And they partner with American Furniture Warehouse on their Artists of the West program. Later we'll meet three of the Colorado artists in the program, but we begin with the art buyer who created the program, Judy LaMontagne, and the CEO of Circle Graphics, yeah, Andrew never. Cousins. <laughs> What a thrill that you were open to letting us come in and talk about this really unique program at a major retailer, supporting artists, not just randomly, but artists right here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. And you coming down here to tell us how your company really helped them make this a workable business model. I really appreciate that too. How did this idea even occur to you, Judy? Well, it started, we were looking at that this morning, almost four years ago. It's really quite amazing how time flies. Mm -hmm. And um, as the buyer at American Furniture, I buy all of the accessories and area rugs, including the wall decor. So about four or five years ago, when the economy was uh, struggling a little bit mm -hmm. more than it is now. We remember it very well. Yes. <laughs> um, I was really struggling with finding the right product that I could bring in that would be the quality level I wanted and mm -hmm. affordable for our customers. And just um, having that uh, having Those that are two search. things that are hard to, to mix together. The, the affordability and the quality that you were looking it is. for. And then at that point in time, I was brought together with Circle Graphics. Um, I, at that point, was talking to Hank Ridless, mm -hmm. who is one of the owners of Circle Graphics, and we start chatting on the phone, and to make uh, several conversations short, um, they came to the table with uh, prices and quality that was better than I was getting elsewhere, and um, the price point was better than I had offered anywhere, even from my China sources. So that means not only are you supporting Western artists, but it's a Colorado company yes. that's producing this. Tell me about how Circle Graphics decided that you could do this, because this really wasn't your business model at all. This isn't the business you were in at the time. No, at the time, Circle Graphics uh, had focused on large format printing. Very large. Very large <laughs> format printing. Um, Circle is the largest uh, printer of billboards in the United States. Uh, and was looking for uh, places to expand the business mm -hmm. and focused on wall decor as a good area where we could uh, use our expertise in, in printing. Uh, and we're very excited to partner with American Furniture Warehouse, uh, as Judy said, almost uh, or just over four years ago. It's that large format equipment that you have that helps you make it not just this quality, but meet that price point that you needed to hit to be able to serve the, the customers here. Yes. Tell me how that works. Well, uh, as I say, extremely large format printing means high volumes. We print over 250 million square feet of, uh, of product per year. That gives us great advantages in terms of our cost of production and, and mm -hmm. the scale of the operation that we have. And we were able to translate that into uh, producing a product line that's, that's at, a, at a great price point and great value. So if a particular image gets reproduced in one big run, uh, on average, um, for these larger formats, notice I say larger here, which really is quite small for you, <laughs> right. um, how many do you print at one time to, to be able to take advantage of the equipment you have? I mean, typically orders come through in quantities of uh, 500 to 1,000. Uh, wow. And that, again, gives us efficiencies as we run that production through the facility. 
Now, in the four years since Judy dreamed up this program and you partnered with American Furniture Warehouse, it's had an economic impact for your business as well. Tell me about that. Uh, it has. We're, we're uh, again, very excited to be part of this program. Uh, it's creating jobs in, in Colorado. Circle Graphics employs over 400 people in uh, Boulder County in Longmont. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it's part of that ecosystem where the artists are here. The, the uh, art that's produced is, is focused on Colorado. Uh, American Furniture Warehouse is a Colorado-centric company and mm -hmm. the, the jobs producing the artwork are here in Colorado. He put that perfectly. It's a, it's a Colorado or Western, now that you're in more than Colorado, yes. focused company. Yes. So the fact that you're, you're using art that's produced by artists who live here it seems like a genius idea, like why wasn't, wasn't it always happening? It's, it's a perfect marriage. It is. Sometimes it's just being that right moment, the right time, a um, little, uh, little luck along the way, but it's been, it's been awesome. And, and really the enjoyment of it is working with the artists. We have almost 50 artists that are part of the program now. Wow. And um, all in fine art, graphic design and photography. And um, it's it's really a, it just it's a ball. It's a lot of fun. You know, I can tell. Me, the really first time we spoke it. about it, I could tell it was fun. And when you began this program, you used the Cherry Creek Arts Festival as part of the way to get a little attention for it. Tell me about how that happened. Well, th that was just to um, initially get some exposure to the artists that are out there. And uh, our, our Did you shop for artists while you were there a, too? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking for artists. Yeah. And then the word of mouth, um, you start uh, chatting with some artists and photographers and then that word spreads. and. And um, I was always saying, well, who do you know? Who do you know? Because mm -hmm. initially when I was talking to Hank and they came forward with these amazing prices and at better quality printing and than anything out there. When you get up really close to it, it's really, really crisp. When you hear that they're doing that many at one time, it, yes, there's the, the idea that it might not be as, as beautiful as it really is. The, the workmanship they're using is, is better than the old um, type of old technology. stretching mm -hmm. on um, the stretcher bars mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's a much better product than you'll see out there in the marketplace but the um, but but the word of mouth just spread through um, our artist community and uh, I'm certain as they as other artists in Colorado are seeing the quality of work that you're able to curate and mm -hmm. reproduce mm -hmm. that they're more eager more willing to take a chance and participate yes and part of it is um, supporting the artist community because mm -hmm. not only do we have the work that's displayed and sold here, which they are paid a royalty on, we, I, I encourage them to um, put their own personal information on our website and we have interactive computer, uh, com, uh, computer boxes in all of our stores so they can um, touch the screen, find out a little bio on the artist, mm. uh, they could put their own personal website. So um, I'm really all about helping to market the artists that are part of our program as well. That's so brilliant. Everyone benefits. So. Tell me about how you curate this collection because as you look up there, there's a wide variety of work, but it does look like a collection. Well, um, quite often it's just looking at the hundreds of <laughs> images that come through our website because mm -hmm. the way they participate is they upload through the home page of our website to be submitted for consideration yes, yes. and um, I honestly do have to delete many actually the majority of them um, just because they're not the, the resolution and quality level that can be printed this large and mm -hmm. still uh, maintain the um, the quality level that we're looking for um, so as I look through what has been submitted, the artists really are determining the direction the program goes because I am open to any topic, any subject matter that is saleable mm -hmm. and um, that is done well. So it evolves and constantly changes. Um, we're always adding new artists and new images to the collection and we have over 200 images on our website now that are all part so of the So more than we can see here, yes. you can choose from some Many on the more. website. And on the website, if you order from the website, Circle Graphics has developed a program for us where it direct ships 
right from Circle Graphics anywhere in the U United States, and we're selling all over the country. So our viewers well. who aren't in Colorado can yes. also have a little piece of Abs Colorado, absolutely. courtesy of Circle Graphics and American Furniture Warehouse. Absolutely. I'm so delighted that we figured out how to get in here before the store opens to talk to you about how this program began, and I know we're going to have a chance to talk to some of the artists who are standing by to find out about their work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. your being here. Now we'll meet three of the artists in the Artists of the West program at American Furniture Warehouse. Brenda Crow, Matt Santomarco, and Mark Pedersen. <laughs> well, what a fun treat to get to sneak into the store before they're open. So I know that two of you work here, but you don't work here. So how did you get connected? That's right. Um, it was actually funny. My mom stumbled across just a small ad in the newspaper a couple of years ago. And she said, hey, Matt, you should take a look at this. There looks like they're doing some sort of local grassroots kind of artist program. So I was like, oh, this could be a good uptick for exposure for my yeah. business, that sort of thing. And it's become so much more than that. And that was a couple of years ago. And now here we are today with this thriving program. And it is amazing how much things have changed in a couple of years, but it just started with the simple little newspaper ad. And the two of you work here, so you knew that they were launching this program. Mm -hmm. Did you let your coworkers and your teammates know that you were artists before that, or was this a surprise to some of your colleagues here at American Furniture Warehouse? Um, for me, um, because I am an artist first, um, most people that I work with already knew that I was an artist, but there were some that didn't, that I don't work maybe as directly with, mm -hmm. that now are aware. Because your job function here is a creative yes. piece. Yes. You do the visual display at one display. of the stores. Yes. And how about for you? Uh, well, I'm the photographer here at American Furniture, so uh, when Judy came to me and said uh, we're planning on doing this program with the uh, with the art, uh, of course, I submitted pictures right away, and because uh, you and already do this on your own, yes, in addition to working here. Yep, correct. Well, that that really speaks to the idea that artists are everywhere here in Colorado, and art is everywhere. So, tell me a little bit about the medium in which you work. You're a photographer in your daytime job. Is that also the medium in which you work? Yes, uh, I do uh, digital photography, and so. Uh, uh, working with digital cameras and then of course the post-processing that goes along with that. So it's not just a literal representation of what you had seen like like uh, photojournalism but it's it's much more artistic because you have that control. Right and uh, you know of course uh, every image can go different ways so uh, I can go for uh, with the control uh, a more realistic or a more surreal or uh, you know a more artistic impression of what I'm shooting and it all kind of just depends and that's what makes it fun because you can just go so many different ways with it. So. And what seems to be your current theme, what, what are the subjects that you shoot? Is it architecture, landscape, people? Uh, yeah, actually uh, architecture and landscape predominantly and uh, uh, I love doing uh, big wide scenic images and, uh, and things along those lines and uh, just uh, fun and interesting taking a look at different things like cityscapes uh -huh. or uh, of course the beautiful Colorado landscapes that are out there. So. What's the medium in which you work? Same thing, uh, digital photography and I primarily shoot um, big sweeping landscapes and then a lot of the urban skyline stuff of Denver. Yeah? Yep. So you also develop and, and work with your images electronically? I do, yes. So I go out in the field, I shoot, and then I come back to my house and then I'll put them together in Photoshop because a lot of times the digital camera has limitations. Yeah. And when you're out shooting these big bright scenes, the camera can't capture that all. Is that HDR photography? Yes, so in the concept, yes. Yeah. So the camera can only take in so much light. So you take different exposures for the light and dark scenes. Of the same image. The same image, yep, and then you put them together. And there's definitely an artistic quality that goes behind it. Everyone does it differently. And I, you see that a lot with landscape photographers. Everyone does it differently. Mm -hmm. So everyone has their own signature. And I've been So that's to the artist part of Exactly, yeah, when they say artist. I mean, you take a picture, it could be the same, but the artist part comes into how they post-process it. Just like in traditional photography, the dark room was really where exactly. the artist. Exactly. You think of Ansel Adams back in the day, his mm -hmm. black and white images. Those were manipulated, not a bad sense, but they were manipulated. They're dodge and burn, which mm -hmm. means they lightened and darkened. So every artist has their own kind of unique signature. And you're a fine mm -hmm. artist. Yes. So what medium do you work in? Acrylics, oil? 
Um, acrylics, but mixed media. Mixed and media. Mixed media. So I like to do a lot of uh, found objects and um, just different products. Along so with how the do you acrylic. describe the, the themes that are represented in the work that's part of this collection at American Furniture Warehouse? Um, I would say mixed media, um, typically non-representational, contemporary abstract. Contemporary abstract, not representational, although you're using found objects in part yeah. of, are you using it in terms of that's how you apply the, the medium or are you trying to paint those textures? How are you using mixed media? In um, actually, I'm creating texture. You're creating texture. Creating texture within the piece. So give me an example of how you might do that. One of my first pieces um, that was in the program has a lot of... Um, Which is on the wall behind you. Yes, has a lot of cement um, that was dry cement, basically, before it's mixed with water, added um, as the layers of paint are being added, it's thrown in there and it creates a lot of texture. And then sometimes as the paint or other products are added in there, it'll crack and just creates a lot of uh, formations and texture, real heavy texture. The kind of the work that you're able to produce, just as your regular body of work, it seems to easily fit into this large collection. Are you, are you informing your work differently now that you're participating in this program? I'm not. You're not? No, my work, it's all the same. It just, you know, and it keeps evolving as an artist because you learn new things, you see new things, you want to try new things, you know, so I just um, submit whatever whatever I, I think is a really good piece and will sell well. So it's not, it's not a question of you're being driven by what, what the colors are in vogue uh, in furnishings this year. You're doing the work that a, any artist would do and it just happens to work. Yeah, whatever's in my heart is what I paint and then if it works for, or if I think it'll work for the program, then that's the stuff that I submit. Does your work, your photography, is, is some of it informed specifically for this project? I'd say so. Um, a lot of times, Judy might give us an idea of what we don't have. Uh -huh. Like, oh, we need more snow scenes, or we need some fall imagery. That I keep in mind when I go out shooting. I say, oh, we need you know something a little different than we currently have. So when I go out trying to shoot, it's more trying to get a diverse product line for the program. It's almost like getting direction from an art director or an almost, editorial yeah. director. I mean, she's not hovering above us by any means. Mm -hmm. We could but go out and you do what, they're, what they're looking for, and then exactly. it's up to you what you do with that. Exactly right. right. Is that also true for your photography? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and I also just like to go out and create images that I like and then see yeah. if other people like them as well. And that's always, uh, always a lot of fun. So One of the things that ex excited me about this program was, of course, it's using Colorado artists, or now Western artists, I really appreciate the chance to meet you and learn a little bit about the art that's being produced specifically for American Furniture Warehouse. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a thrill to be able to come in before the store opens and meet the person who created this program, the company that produces the work, and of course, as always, most important are the artists who conceive of the work that you can buy right here at American Furniture Warehouse. If you want more details, you can just visit their webpage, afwonline.com. Now we shift gears and go to E-Town Hall in Boulder for Local Lab by Local Theatre Company. And right after her master class, I sat down with guest artist Jill Rafson, the literary manager from Roundabout Theatre Company. <laughs> What an exciting opportunity for the writers here that attended Local Lab by Local Theater to learn from a literary manager of a major New York theater company. That was kind of fun for them. What was it like for you to have that kind of opportunity? Well, new play development is exciting wherever you're doing it because the artists are all talented. There are more great playwrights out there than there are opportunities to get your work done. So anytime you go to a place like this, you're going to find interesting talent who you want to be working with. What is a literary manager in terms of how it functions at the Roundabout Theatre Company? At Roundabout, the literary manager means I'm basically the point person for all plays all the time. <laughs> so uh, everything that gets sent to the company starts with me, um, and I figure out what I'm reading or who else is reading which plays, by whom, um, and making sure that every play that comes into our company gets a response. Um, you know, it's really important that if people are spending their time putting their heart and soul into these works, that they're getting an answer from everybody they send their play to. Not unsolicited material, but, but material that's solicited either by agent representation or you've met them somewhere. That exactly, sort of thing. exactly. So um, we don't want to flood you with scripts. But <laughs> <laughs> it happens anyway. It happens but, anyway. <laughs> but the floodgates are limited. The floodgates are limited. What is it that um, 
you get as a literary manager from coming to a smaller theater company like this here in Boulder, Colorado? What is it you get aside from meeting other playwrights? I love hearing from the audience here because it's an audience that is extremely well trained in how to watch a reading and how to listen to new plays. Mm -hmm. So I've been loving listening to their answers um, and just hearing their conversations about the work that we're seeing mm -hmm. because to me it's really revealing. Um, I think that a lot of the time with New York audiences, um, there's a sort of been there, done that feeling. Um, and in a way, maybe they're <laughs> oversaturated by yeah. the theater that's around them. Mm -hmm. So um, in a case like this where there are just there's a lot of great work out there, but there's less of it uh, to work your way through. I think that people have really interesting things to say and they're, in, they're desperate to talk about it. So the conversations are just different. Yeah. The work you're doing there is, is still pretty new for Roundabout mm -hmm. Theatre Company. Um, I, I know you shared it with us this morning, but tell us again, if you can, how this work at Roundabout Theatre Company even began. Well, Roundabout's a company that was founded on doing revivals, and the idea was putting great actors into the great plays and seeing them again. Um, and once you start doing great plays by authors who are still around, it becomes pretty irresistible when those authors say, I actually have a new play that I'd like to share with you. So that's how Roundabout first got into it. It was saying, mm -hmm. of course I'd like to do the new Pinter or the new Brian Friel play. Um, so that is how we first got into it with more established playwrights. Right. And then it became clear that if you're going to start working on new plays, you have to be fostering the new voices as well, um, the people mm -hmm. who need your help. And I feel like it's the job of a large institution like the Roundabout to support those writers because we can do that. We have the ability to help those writers early in their careers uh, to be supported by this theater. So we decided to expand and do the Roundabout Underground program, which supports uh, the first production, first professional production by a writer in New York. And it's meant to be a career launch pad. The idea is to introduce them to a New York audience mm -hmm. and hopefully make them um, you know, a commonplace part of the theater scene in New York and to see their work again and again. Um, it all started because we did a play in a big theater in front of the wrong audience. And we realized- What does that mean when you say in front of the wrong audience? It means that sometimes, um, you know, when your company is known for doing one kind of work, uh, your audience comes in with a certain set of expectations. Mm -hmm. And when you do something different, they might find it exciting or they might find it off-putting. Right. Um, and because they walk <laughs> in with a, a certain uh, lens, they're going to see that play differently. And, uh, and the response from both audience and uh, the press changes based on the set of expectations going in. So we, having seen that go wrong with one play, we didn't want to ever do a writer a disservice again by putting his play in front of an audience that wasn't open to what he was trying to say. Um, and that's fine, you know, there's room for all kinds of theater. And what we realized was that we needed to be doing these, uh, these newer works by people who the audience didn't go in with any context for in a space that was more welcoming to that. Um, so it made us set a low ticket price of $20. It made it a general admission space. It's literally 62 seats, a tiny black box. And, uh, and audiences walk in with a different perspective when they go into that space. It also gives you a chance to take different kinds of risks than you might on your main stage. Exactly. I mean, whether it's using uh, directors who are brand new to us and just seeing what they can do, it's new designers. You know, it tends to be emerging artists across the board on the entire creative team. Um, it lets us try things with the content of the plays themselves that might be stylistically more challenging, mm -hmm. content-wise more challenging. Um, it's just, uh, it's an interesting place for us to be able to experiment, but it also gets the full support of the institution. Because so, it's a full, real a full New production. York production. Um, when we first launched the program, we realized there are a lot of theaters that are doing a lot of reading. There are a lot of theaters that have writers groups. And when we talked to playwrights and said, what do you need? They said productions. Yeah. Um, so that's what we decided to offer. When you say you work with playwrights beyond producing the play, what is it that you mean when you say you work with playwrights to develop their work? That's the sort of dramaturgical side of the literary management work. Which and no one ever knows what that means. Nope. <laughs> um, and to me, on a new play, it means asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. um, it's being a voice in the room who hasn't been sitting and staring at these pages for months and months, um, and being able to say things to the playwright that they need someone who hasn't been in it um, to say. You know, I actually don't think that. Uh, on a new play, it's always helpful to have a dramaturg in the rehearsal room every day right. because then you're you're too attached. 
um, and it's better to come at it a couple of weeks later and make a return mm. to the rehearsal room and say, here's what I see that's changed and where do you want this to be going? So it's much more than a researcher. It's a sounding board, it's a researcher, it's an editor. Exactly, you know, the, the research aspect comes in if it's a period piece or if you're doing a revival. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of new plays, they don't need that aspect. They just need you to be um, an advocate for the play and to be uh, constantly talking about the play and asking the right questions of them. There was a time when regional theaters were only responding to what happened in New York, mm -hmm. which is where you do your work. Now there seems to be a much more balanced exchange between regional theaters and the New York stage. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Roundabout position and your work in that way since you're here in Colorado. Yeah, I've made an effort to just go to more places in the last few years because I think there's so much great new work out there and I just want to find the best voices and bring them into my company. Um, you know, it's also great because partnerships are so helpful. Um, I only have a certain number of slots where I can do new play productions mm -hmm. and there are a lot more plays than that that I fall in love with every year. So it's about helping the writers we love to find another home maybe or oh. for them to get development work out out of town before they come into New York when we do have a slot ready. Um, that happens a lot with plays we've commissioned. You know, there might be a play that we're developing and the writer says, I'm not ready to show it to a New York audience yet. And so we might partner up with another company and, uh, and have mm. a full production or just a reading or some workshop. Um, there are all sorts of different opportunities out there. Uh, to get the work done so that they're ready for it when it comes into New York. Well, I know the audiences here this weekend have really enjoyed interacting with you at the end of the readings, and the writers today really loved that chance to hear what a literary manager was looking for, and I wondered what you're taking back to the roundabout with you, aside from maybe a, a new relationship with a playwright. Well, it's fun for me to get to talk about the plays like this. Um, you know, roundabout, we tend to do talkbacks after a production is done. Um, you know, we do it with the audience getting to ask questions of the author and of the director and of the actors, and it's so different for me or for the playwright to be getting to ask the audience questions. Mm -hmm. So I've loved just tackling it at a completely different phase of development um, because you learn absolutely different answers from that. Well, I know that this particular weekend there was a very strong relationship between Roundabout and local theater mm -hmm. because of at least one of the playwrights, and I can't wait to see what might come of that, and I hope that you'll come back to Colorado again soon. Me too. Thanks so much for giving us a little time before you have to go back into another reading today. Thank you. You can find all the details about local theater and their next local lab online at localtheatercompany.org. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. Good night.